And we now pass on to the major event of this evening, a presentation by Professor Sarah Murray. Sarah Murray is currently assistant professor of classics at the University of Toronto. She is a cultural historian and archaeologist specializing in the material culture and institutions of early Greece, especially the history of exchange between the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean, and the social archaeology of the early Iron Age Aegean. She completed her BA in classical archaeology at Dartmouth College in 2004, then received a PhD in classics from Stanford University in 2013. She has over a decade of fieldwork experience in the Mediterranean, mostly in Greece. She is currently co-directing an archaeological survey project around the Bay of Porto Rafti in eastern Attica. Her scholarly publications include two monographs, The Collapse of the Mycenaean Economy, published in 2017, Male Nudity in the Greek Iron Age, which appeared in 2022, and single or co-authored articles and reports in scholarly journals, including the Journal of Field Archaeology, Journal of, Ar of Archaeological Research, American Journal of Archaeology, Isperia Antiquity, Museon, and the Journal of Archaeological Science, the report section. Her lecture this evening is entitled Porto Rafti Bay in the Post-Collapsed Aegean, Documenting a Prosperous Maritime Mercantile Community Through Surface Survey. I welcome Sarah Murray. But you're going to help me to close this and open yours. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much um, to Jacques for the introduction. Um, and I'd also like to uh, thank the CIG for um, inviting me to uh, present um, some of our research um, from Porto Rafti uh, in a little more detail um, at tonight's uh, meeting. So, uh, this talk will mostly concern uh, finds from uh, an archaeological field survey. Um, sponsored by the Canadian Institute. Um, and uh, of course, all archaeological projects require the input of many people. Um, and I'll be presenting the finds um, on behalf of our whole team. Um, so I just want to start by thanking uh, everyone uh, who's helped to make our project possible, um, especially the Canadian Institute in Greece. Uh, the director, Jacques Perrault, uh, and the assistant director, Jonathan Tomlinson, as well as the Fieldwork um, Permits Committee for supporting our project administratively um, and assisting us with the permitting project uh, or process. Uh, I also want to thank um, our colleagues in the East Attica effort of antiquities, especially the director, uh, Dr. Eleni Andriku, um, for supporting the project and um, helping us also with the permit. Um, Additional thanks are due to the um, Brauron Archaeological Museum and its staff, especially the director, Katerina Petru. Um, our lab is in the Brauron Museum, and the museum very kindly provides us with uh, space uh, to work and also um, takes care of storage for artifacts uh, over the winter, and we're really grateful for um, their assistance. Um, finally, we'd like to thank uh, all the uh, financial support uh, the institutes that have provided financial support for the project, including the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Loeb Library Foundation, um, and the Institute for the Study of Aegean Prehistory, um, uh, as well as my university, the University of Toronto, our Classics Department, and the Archaeology Center, who have generously supported uh, student travel um, so that people can come out and work on the project. Uh, I also want to thank our wonderful team, um, all of my colleagues, uh, and my co-director of the project, Catherine Pratt, um, for making it both uh, pleasurable um, and relatively um, painless, uh, in fact, to um, run this project in Porto Rafti. Uh, so thanks to everybody. 
the the talk I will give today um, is uh, focused not on all the finds from the survey, um, but just on the finds from the um, post collapse Aegean period uh, referenced in the title. Uh, Specifically, we're talking here about the post, uh, the collapse at the end of the, the, the Mycenaean period, at the end of the Bronze Age. Um, there's plenty more to say about other periods, but um, for the sake of getting into some of the details, uh, I'll focus today on the, um, the final My Mycenaean material. Uh, I'll start with a little bit of an introduction, um, both to the archaeology of Porto Rafi um, and also how it fits into the story of the Mycenaean collapse, um, as, as well as how we came to um, conceive of and begin um, a surface survey project in Porto Rafti Bay. Uh, then I'll um, produce the goods. So I'll uh, tell you all about the LH3C um, finds that we've um, discovered in the survey. Uh, and then finally, I will hope I'll be able to convince you that the three adjectives I've used in the title, prosperous, maritime, and mercantile, are in fact apt uh, adjectives to describe the community that um, we've been documenting through surface survey uh, in the project. So that's the plan. Starting with uh, a little bit of background information, um, so the, the results I'll be sharing with you are from this project, the Bays of East Attica Regional Survey that Jacques mentioned in his presentation. Um, so the project is based around the Bay of Porto Rafti um, in eastern Attica. Uh, so Porto Rafti is located um, here on the central east coast of Attica. Um, it's about 35 kilometers east of Athens uh, and about a 15 minute drive from Athens International Airport, depending on the beach traffic. <laughs> um, so as you can see in the satellite photo to the right, uh, the bay is a large bay. Um, it provides an excellent natural anchorage. Um, the bay is divided more or less into north and south sections um, by this uh, central peninsula of Punda here, um, and its topography is characterized also by um, several islets, um, Raf Raftis, Raftapula, and Prasso, um, as well as the rocky headland uh, of Caroni um, that juts out at the south um, terminus of the bay. Porto Rafti gets its name from an archaeological artifact. Um, so at the peak of the islet of Raftis in the center of the mouth of the bay here um, resides a above life-sized uh, statue of a Roman god or goddess. Um, and this is known locally as the Raftis. Um, the local lore has it that um, the statue before presumably it lost its head and its arms, uh, represented a, a tailor, or raftis in Greek, um, who was once holding aloft a glorious pair of golden scissors. Um, so hence the name raftis for the island, and hence the name Porto Rafti for the bay, um, the, the port of the tailor. The raftis is by far the most famous archeological artifact uh, from Porto Rafti Bay, um, but it's far from um, the only um, bit of known archeology span um, from previous research in Porto Rafti. Um, so there are a number of sites uh, that have been excavated around the Bay of Porto Rafti, um, as well as a number of surface scatters that have been documented um, unsystematically over the last 100 or 150 years. Um, and they're from a range of dates uh, from the final Neolithic period um, through to late Roman. Our project is concerned with all these periods, of course, um, but tonight I only have time to talk about the, the LH3C, late Helladic 3C, um, the late Mycenaean material. Um, so uh, instead of introducing you to all of these sites, um, I'll just uh, provide a little bit of background for um, the, the sort of previously known history of Porto Rafti in the final Mycenaean period um, by introducing you to this the main prehistoric site in the region that's been excavated, which is the cemetery of Perati um, here on the north um, uh, coast. So the cemetery of Perati um, was excavated uh, by the Greek archeologist Spiridon Yokovides uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, the site is a large uh, cemetery, uh, which includes both uh, chamber tombs and pit tombs. The primary, most common form of burial in the cemetery are chamber tombs with multiple inhumations. There are some chamber tombs with cremations also, <coughs> cremation bur burials also, uh, and there are some uh, in single inhumations in pit tombs. 
although there's a lot of variety in the style of burial at Parati, um, all the tombs date to a single period, to the late Hellenic 3C period, roughly the 12th and the first half of the 11th century BC. To understand why the site of Parati is interesting or important, um, we need a little bit of very general background on um, the sort of cadence and progress of society in the um, Aegean, the Mycenaean mainland Bronze Age. Um, so the early Mycenaean period begins in the middle of the second millennium, roughly 1600 BC, or the transition from the middle to the late Hellenic period. Um, and in general, in the, the Greek bronze, the Greek mainland, um, the early Mycenaean period is characterized by the appearance of richly furnished tombs that seem to be related to increasing political complexity. The late Mycenaean period, beginning around 1400 BC, or LH, uh, to the LH23 transition in ceramic terms, signals the maturation and extension of these uh, sort of nascent states. <coughs> late Mycenaean states uh, developed sh seemingly shared political structures with a king called the Wanox, um, who seems to have been re residing or based in specialized architectural complexes uh, that we refer to as palaces. As something bad seems to have happened to these palatial states around 1200 BC, um, and there's apparent uh, episodes of destruction, not only in the Aegean, but also um, around the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, the post-palatial period that succeeds the palatial period starting in the 12th century is characterized by less apparent political complexity, um, less connection between the Aegean and other parts of the Mediterranean, um, and then a general decline in what we see as far as complexity and wealth in material culture. So that's a sort of general narrative of what's going on in the Aegean Late Bronze Age um, and the context in which the Parati Cemetery belongs, right, in this LH3C um, period. And while this is not a bad characterization of what's generally going down in the Aegean um, in these periods, um, the story of collapse is certainly not the whole story um, of the LH3C period. So there certainly are some sites that are destroyed or abandoned, but there are many other sites uh, that are not destroyed or abandoned, but rather see either continuity or a seeming opposite of collapse, right? A sort of fluorescence uh, of wealth or an increase in wealth um, from the previous period. Parati belongs in this category. There's essentially zero LH3A or B material in the Bay of Porto Rafti. So whoever is burying their dead in the LH3C cemetery at Parati seems to have been newly arrived in the Bay. Um, and certainly there's no evidence uh, for a large um, complex population, uh, the likes of which we seem to have represented in the burials at Parati. In addition to the sort of size of the cemetery, indications of, of prosperity at Parati um, include um, an unusual number of imported objects from the Eastern Mediterranean for the LH3C period. Um, so there are um, a, a large number for the period of imports like scarabs, uh, Egyptian scarabs or amulets, um, cylinder seals uh, from Cyprus and the, the Syro Levantine coast, um, various other kind of imports that um, we don't find in plentiful numbers at other sites from this period. Uh, the cemetery also produced a large quantity of very nice pottery, um, including some imported materials like um, this uh, stirrup jar and a Euboean fabric showing a lovely bird family scene, um, and this other stirrup jar which shows a kind of natural um, uh, landscape scene uh, that's an import from West Crete. So it seems like something unusual is going on in this bay in the LH3C period, or that's what the material from the cemetery would lead us to believe. Um, of course, such an assemblage raises many interesting <coughs> questions. Uh, if there was a prosperous uh, new community living in Porter Rafti Bay in the LH3C period after the Mycenaean collapse, um, where exactly were they living? When Yakovides was excavating the tombs, uh, there was very little development in Porter Rafti Bay, unlike now. <laughs> which is almost all development. Um, and it seems that he was interested in locating a settlement, um, but doesn't seem to have been successful um, looking around the, the mainland around the bay. Um, so there's always been this open question of where were the people who are using the cemetery um, living? 
Uh, another question would be, if this community moved here and was quite prosperous, um, what was the basis of their prosperity? Um, lots of other interesting questions could be asked uh, about what's going on in this bay uh, following the Mycenaean collapse. Now, regarding the location of the settlement, there are known LH3C surface scatters that have been apparent for um, you know, most of the last, uh, most of the 20th century. So people who have visited Raftis Island and Raftapula Islets have noticed that there are LH3C scatters um, on these islands. Now, um, perhaps with good reason, there has not been widespread agreement that the existence of these LH3C shirt scatters signals to us that there is a settlement or the main settlement for the Parati community on Raftis Islet. Um, certainly, this is a possibility that some scholars have discussed, um, including recently uh, Florian Rupenstein here quoted in the recent um, Athens and Attica in Prehistory Conference volume. Um, but I think for good reason, many people reject the idea that this prosperous community would have decided to live on um, Raftis. Uh, problems with living on Raftis Island, uh, it's not particularly large, uh, although it's, all, it's not all that small. It's about 430 by 300 meters, so it looks smaller on the map than it really is. Um, it's very steep. Uh, there's no water on the island, um, and obviously there's not much potential for agricultural production on, the, on, the, uh, on, on such a, a forbidding landscape. Um, Currently, it's very hard to dock a boat anywhere on the island. Um, the shoreline probably, probably would have been different in the Bronze Age. Um, but there are many reasons to believe that, um, many reasons to be skeptical uh, that some sort of wealthy community like the one using the Parati Cemetery might choose to live on this island. On the other hand, uh, living on such an island might provide certain benefits. Um, the one most frequently discussed would be safety. Uh, so people sometimes call, would call this a kind of a refuge um, settlement. Uh, obviously, you could see your enemies coming. If your enemies did not have a boat, it would be hard for them to reach you. Um, so there are various ways in which uh, living on an island could be connected to concern for safety. Um, at the same time, right, an advantage for living on rafties might be uh, that it offers quick access to the sea, right, to maritime routes, um, which could have been um, in the pros list uh, if you're deciding whether to invest in a property um, here on Rafties Island. But essentially, um, up until uh, you know, we decided to start the survey, uh, there wasn't really that much evidence to go from um, in terms of coming to a clear conclusion about whether they were or whether they were living on rafties. Um, so there's a small British school study collection um, from around 1950 um, that has been uh, the only resource sort of for people wanting to know more about whether or not these island um, assemblages might represent something important connected with the Parati Cemetery. Um, I myself have spent uh, now over a, well over a decade uh, grappling with questions regarding the meaning of the Parati assemblage um, and uh, what, what might be going on in, in Puerto Rafti Bay after the Bronze Age collapse. So I did my dissertation on connections between the, East, the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean sort of during and after the Bronze Age collapse. And so this brought me um, into uh, the world of Parati and its many imports. Um, I discussed the more in the subsequent book and then wrote an article trying to sort of reanalyze and, and reassess um, what might be going on in the Port of Rafti Bay based on the cemetery finds. But ultimately, I think myself and most other people interested in these questions had re reached a sort of impasse there's only so much analytical clarity you can get about a living community uh, based on the choices they make around um, mortuary um, practices. So hence was born um, the Bays of East Attica Regional Survey, which um, I co-direct with Catherine Pratt. Um, one of the ideas about the survey was, we know there are these surface assemblages on Raftis and Raftopola at least, um, perhaps if we systematically document them and take a closer look, we can get to some surer answers about whether this might be a location of a settlement in the 3C period. And perhaps by doing survey around the Port of Rafti elsewhere, we could find out right, other things about um, uh, 12th and 11th century settlement um, in the Bay. So the Bears project, we began in 2019. Um, and we've had uh, two other seasons since then, in 2021 and 22. Um, 
as I said, there's lots of other archaeological material in the bay, and we've been studying uh, many other chronological aspects of what's going on. Um, if you want to read about that, we have two preliminary reports out in um, Museon issues 17 and 19. I think it's fully 150 plus pages of preliminary reports on survey outcomes, so um, you'll find, I think, whatever you need about other periods there. Um, for now, I will just tell you what we have found um, in our survey from the LH3C period, um, and then proceed to discuss how uh, we think it might impact our understanding of um, the Porto Rafti Bay uh, in the LH3C period. Okay, so the main locations where we found um, LH3C material um, are Raftis, Raftapula, not unexpected, um, but also um, Prasso Islet uh, and Caroni. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the material from each of these uh, locations um, in sequence. Now, I say we have dense shared scatters on Raftis and Prasso, um, and so I'll start with some numbers just to give you a sense of uh, the density of these archaeological um, uh, surface scatters. So immediately when we visited both islands, we perceived there was a lot of material on the ground. So rather than walking sort of typical uh, survey transects, we divided the sites into grids and collected in um, grid squares. So on Raftis, we have 137 20 by 20 grid squares. On Press, we had 107. Um, these are the quantities of pottery we've collected. Um, and you can see that there are also many tiles that were weighed patiently by our survey teams, um, as well as some lithics and a collection of other items. Um, but these numbers don't really give you a sense of the density of the surface assemblages um, because these collections of pottery are very selective. Um, on both islets, the surface pottery is very well preserved. Um, and so we're sort of sorting through diagnostics and trying to get a representative sample. Um, we did some total collection squares where we collected actually everything on the ground um, on both Rafis and Prasso. Um, and you can see the kind of percentages. So our collection numbers are between 5 and 10% of the material that's actually um, on the ground. Um, and some of the squares are just really dense with stuff. Um, so pushing 3,000 individual uh, shards of pottery in a 20 by 20 meters square, and usually our visibility was, was poor. So um, they're really, um, in my years of surveying Greece, um, they're, I think, the densest assemblages that I've ever uh, encountered. Okay, so let's start with Raftis, which of course has been um, frequently raised as a candidate for a settlement site associated with uh, the Parati Cemetery. Um, we've completed surveying Raftis uh, over two seasons in 2019 and 2022. Um, and I'll just give you an overview of um, the material uh, that we have um, recorded. So as far as the, the ceramic assemblage, um, in part be because of the excellent preservation of material on the site, um, we're able to almost always identify the, um, the shape uh, that sherds represent, which is often not the case in survey, um, as most survey archaeologists will know. Um, so far, just in the cataloged pottery, um, that's very well preserved, especially well preserved. We've cataloged 38 different um, shapes, uh, ranging from things like pithoi and vats and bathtubs to fine wares and miniature, seemingly ritual vessels. Um, it seems like the, the full repertoire, um, I'll thank here uh, Bartek Lees, who's studying the LA3C pottery, um, and uh, almost all of these insights come from Bartek. Um, so we have many different shapes, many different um, functions uh, and sort of grades of material um, in the 3C pottery from Raftis. Um, the dates, we have a little bit of LH3P3C transitional, so it could be that the site is act, occupied a little bit earlier than the cemetery, which wouldn't be unexpected, um, but almost everything is 3C middle and 3C late. Um, so things skew on the later end of things rather than the earlier things. Um, there are a few imports from around the Aegean, um, but mostly, uh, mostly not imports. Uh, one of the features of the assemblage that's um, <coughs> really outstanding uh, are, um, oh, so we have a lot, let me say, we have a lot of uh, really well-preserved, decorated, painted Mycenaean pottery. Um, so you can see these drawings here um, 
where there's a lot of decor decoration preserved. So we have a lot of Mycenaean fine wares. Um, amongst them, we have three shards of pictorial pottery. Um, so on the left here are a pair of legs, um, bird or human, uh, no, no one can decide. Uh, the body of a quadruped here from a, a, a crater with some added paint in white, um, and perhaps uh, something that could be part of a boat. Uh, so, so far we have three pictorial pottery shards. Um, one of the most exceptional aspects of the assemblage from Raftis are not the fine wares, but the, um, the cookwares. Uh, so there's a sort of vast range of different kinds of cooking pottery from the site, including many different sh types of griddle, um, as well as interesting flat casserole type dishes. Um, I think tripod cooking pot feet must be the most abundant find from the whole island. Um, there are hundreds of those. Um, so it's this is a very unusual kind of assemblage for the LH3C period when cooking wares tend to get simpler um, rather than more complex. Um, so Bartek tells me that this kind of assemblage is more, um, the best comparanda come from palatial sites um, rather than sites from the earlier palatial sites rather than sites from the 3C period. So we have a lot of nice uh, um, different kinds of uh, cuisines perhaps being cooked uh, on rafties. Um, another very un unusual find from 2022 um, from rafties is this uh, torch holder. Um, which seems to be a very unusual shape to encounter. Um, there's a conferandum from Schliemann's excavation at Tiran's, um, but as you can see, ours is perforated with many different holes. Um, we're not really sure uh, what, what the function, I mean, the function may have been holding torches, um, but this is a, um, you know, a kind of rare find for any site, I think, and it's not clear what it would be doing on um, this steep rocky islet. Uh, there's also evidence for industrial production on rafties in the form of um, technical ceramics and um, slags from uh, copper working. Uh, so perhaps some kind of industrial production on the site. Uh, some interesting tidbits that might lead us to suggest connections with Cyprus. Um, so this is one of my favorite finds from the survey. It is not obviously very charismatic. Um, it is a small uh, clay ball, um, about two centimeters in diameter. Um, uh, but it, it's similar in type to clay balls that are found in Cypriot contexts that people aren't entirely sure of their um, function, but it seems to be a Cypriot type of artifact. They're often uh, epigraphic, so they have um, Cypriot and script on them. This one isn't epigraphic, but uh, Cassandra Donnelly who's come to visit and take a look, says it looks very Cypriot to her. Um, she's also taken a look at some um, pot marks um, on shirts from Rafti's, which she says also seem um, to be co possibly connected to Cypriot marking practices. Uh, amongst other small finds, uh, we have 64 pieces of uh, Mycenaean figurines from Rafti's, uh, both anthropo anthropomorphic and zoomorphic. Uh, most of the zoomorphic um, figurines are bulls, which is not unexpected. We have at least two horses, um, and then we have this uh, head of a figure rather than a figurine, uh, which is uh, an animal uh, that uh, we have not yet identified. Um, and there's a whole range of other small finds, um, which I won't go into, including balance weights in um, metal and stone, uh, different tools for textile production, um, sort of Mycenaean beads and buttons, um, a variety of, of material has come out of the surface collections. Now, perhaps the most flabbergasting uh, of the finds from Rafti's are the ground stone objects. Um, so up to now, we've cataloged over 450 ground stone artifacts from, uh, from this island. Um, they're in a wide range of materials, um, many of them are for grinding, but we have all kinds of tools for uh, pounding, um, chopping, um, polishing, uh, etc. So this is a very large groundstone assemblage for a survey. Um, notable amongst the groundstones are uh, pieces of tripod mortars. Um, so this is a, a special kind of groundstone um, grinding tool that has uh, feet carved out of it, hence the tripod mortars. Um, so we have over 14 fragments of tripod mortars, which is a relatively rare type 
um, at least of the Ajit and the three C period. Um, some of them show saw marks from having been sort of dismantled or destroyed on purpose. Uh, and this large um, sort of two joining fragments of a spouted tripod mortar um, appears to have been purposely destroyed as well. Um, so there are kind of hack marks on the bottom where the middle has been um, destroyed. Just as intriguing are uh, many pieces of raw or only partially worked ground stone material. Um, so we have pieces of andesite that have quarry marks from being just chopped off of the source. Um, we have a piece of a tripod mortar preform that is a piece that was being worked into a tripod mortar but never was finished. Um, and then this is like a Labrador retriever sized boulder uh, of unworked andesite. So uh, I want to thank Eleni Krayazubenu um, and Grace Erni, who have been patiently cataloging, weighing, uh, and um, uh, measuring all the ground stones on Rafti's Island. Um, Eleni is an expert on ground stones and, and tells us she's pretty sure this would be a production site um, for um, ground stone tools of various kinds. Uh, if we think there is a settlement on Rafti's, we would want to find some architecture. Um, and there are many walls uh, and wall foundations uh, on Rafti's that we've been mapping with the DGPS. Um, most of the island is covered in rubble, um, which seems to be from building collapse. Um, but in and amongst the rubble, we can find um, many scraps of walls that um, in some cases are probably Mycenaean. Uh, I say in some cases because there is a late Roman component on the site as well. Um, so in this lower... Uh, southwestern corner of the island, we have late Roman finds um, from the 6th and 7th century CE, but most of the island is pretty much 90% um, LH3C all over the place. Um, so we think that there are probably um, some buildings at least, or building remains that look Mycenaean. Um, so overall, uh, we feel pretty happy with the evidence now pointing clearly towards a settlement um, of some kind on Rafti's simply the abundance of material, um, as well as the range of material, um, seems like a good, uh, a good, at least a new data set to work with as we think through this question. Um, so I'll talk a little bit briefly about our other um, fine spots for LH3C material, um, starting with Prasso. Um, so we went to survey on Prasso in 2021, uh, not imagining we would find any uh, LH3C material because the only uh, publication that we could find that mentioned Prasso uh, only mentioned um, Roman and Byzantine pottery. Um, so Vermeule went there uh, in, while trying to find a settlement associated with the Rafti statue um, in the early 1960s in connection with uh, research on Caroni um, and noted only late Roman pottery. Um, our experience of Prasso was very different. Um, again, we found a very abundant sur surface scatter that included material from every period that is documented at all in Porto Rafti. Um, so from the final Neolithic period all the way through to late Roman and almost everything in between, um, including archaic and classical material, which we don't have for most other parts of the survey area. Um, so th again, this was a, a sort of wild surface assemblage to document. Um, in and amongst the many periods um, was again, a assemblage of relatively abundant and well-preserved um, LH3C material. The LH3C material from Prasso uh, seems like it might be a little bit earlier, so some material might also be 3B. Um, but overall, it's very similar in type to the Rafti's material for the most part. Um, the big news from Prasso uh, was the discovery of many um, wasters and waste products from pottery production. So a survey on Prasso produced um, sort of heaps and globs of overfired or completely destroyed um, ceramic material um, and a number of fabrics that were recognizably those that are present in the survey material from Rafti's and also the Cemetery of Parati. So we have a sort of typical attic fabric. Uh, there is a piece of cooking fabric um, that's glued onto or adhering to a, um, some of this whiteware fabric. Uh, but the most abundant kind of ceramic waste we have from Prasso is this green stuff, um, which is the color that uh, this regional ware called white ware uh, apparently turns when um, it's cooked way too hot in the kiln. Um, of all the fun I've had on a survey project, I would say getting to Munsell 
things in the gray area of the Munsell book is a real highlight. Um, so we're thankful to Whiteware for fire over firing into these wonderful sort of greenish yellow globs. <coughs> so Whiteware um, is very common, is a, a, the common fabric in the Paraty Cemetery. Um, so Bartek Lees, again, who's working with us, um, has published a lot and studied uh, whiteware from the Parati Cemetery. So this is what um, the whiteware looks like when it's not burnt into um, glay. Uh, and from our survey on rafties in 2019, we did find some over-fired sherds, uh, and there's some evidence from the Parati Cemetery in the form of this sort of burnt jug, uh, which led us to sort of hypothesize that maybe whiteware was being produced somewhere in Puerto Rafti. Um, but the material from Prasso um, seems to show that it definitely was. Um, this is important for interpreting uh, the community in Puerto Rafti because uh, whiteware is widely distributed around the Aegean in the LH3C period. Um, so this is a map of all the sites where uh, Bartek has identified whiteware, either through analytical um, uh, investigation or through looking at published reports. Um, so you can see it's traded widely up and down the Ubian Gulf, um, down towards the Argolid and across uh, to the Eastern Aegean. Now, just because we have whiteware being produced in Puerto Rafti doesn't mean that's the only place that this kind of pottery was produced. Um, but Bartek's analytical work, along with his colleagues, uh, indicates that most of the whiteware, at least what they've sampled, is, is pretty much identical to, its, to each other. Um, so he thinks there's just one production place for this widely traded pottery. Um, and it looks like perhaps that's Porta Rafti. Um, the plot somewhat thickens with our figurine assemblage from Prasso, um, which includes uh, a number of figurines that are also made in whiteware. Um, so if they're producing whiteware pottery here, it seems like they may also be producing figurines in the same kilns. The best figurine of the assemblage is this uh, two pieces of a, of a zoomorphic figurine that join, uh, made in whiteware, and have been poked with 35 different holes pre-firing. Um, so Valisi Gillespie, who's looking at the figurine, suggests that it could be some sort of voodoo, um, uh, something going on. But uh, more likely, she thinks that could be having, there could be some experimentation going on with uh, trying to fire these larger figurines in the kiln. Um, the holes were somehow related to that. So Prasso, um, now we think, is uh, perhaps used for a settlement in 3C. Um, again, you get a range of kind of industrial wares all the way through to fine wares. Um, but we're relatively certain this was also a kiln site um, for the production of uh, at least whiteware, but also perhaps other things like cooking fabric um, and other fine wares. Uh, we did survey Raftapula, which is another place where 3C material has been noticed um, in 20. Um, 22. I won't say too much about that assemblage uh, because it's very similar to what we have on rafties, just less dense. So we have ground stone, um, things we think are related to metallurgical production, a combination of late Roman and um, LHVC pottery. Uh, the only unusual thing on Raftapola was a piece of a human bone. Um, and there has been discussion that Raftapola could have been used as burial, as a burial site instead of a settlement site. Um, Finally, last but not least, uh, Caroni. Um, we've done a lot of survey on the Caroni Peninsula, um, and it's mostly later classical Hellenistic uh, and Roman material. Um, but we do have uh, both um, a sort of smattering of LH3C sherds from this part of the peninsula below the Acropolis, um, and also some large complexes that look very much like they could my be Mycenaean. Although there isn't much pottery surviving on Caroni today from the 3C period, um, it's also very rangy. So we have pithoi, vats, cooking ware, and also fine wares. Um, so it's entirely possible that this too, right, was a site of LH3C settlement, but that the later disturbance of the site has um, reduced the service assemblage so that it's not as immediately impressive as what we have on, say, rafties. So that concludes my review of the finds from the 3C period. Um, so just to recap briefly, uh, on Raftis, there's a, a large quantity of very nice Mycenaean pottery that's well preserved, including um, very diverse uh, cooking pottery and a few imports. Um, 
Raftis has also produced a very large quantity of groundstone objects, um, perhaps uh, indicating a production center. Um, there's a little bit of evidence for metal processing and probably a lot of architecture um, that uh, has collapsed, um, but it was in some cases still visible. On Prasa, we have another 3C scatter um, and almost certainly a whiteware production center. Um, and Caroni, uh, we're still looking at the architecture, but we do think um, that there are some Mycenaean building complexes uh, on the western part of the peninsula. So uh, just to conclude with my adjectives, um, I think it's not a hard sell to say that this community seems to have been reasonably prosperous. Um, right, The finds from the tombs are, are quite um, abundant and uh, rich for the period. Uh, the people who are living on the islands seem to have access to things like fancy decorated fine wares, um, including pictorial craters um, in some abundance. Uh, and they have very posh uh, cookery, um, uh, cooking pottery that um, indicates, again, something sophisticated, perhaps culturally, is going on um, with this community. Uh, the maritime adjective uh, emerges from our observation that the main collections of 3C material that we've documented are on these very sort of maritime oriented islands. There seems to be little evidence on um, the hinterland side of the bay, um, at least that we've been able to document. And of course, there's an issue of coverage here because it's very hard to survey most of Puerto Rafti Bay right now due to development. Um, but in 2022, we were able to um, sort of sneak <coughs> survey units in and amidst the concrete uh, holiday homes um, to the extent we could. And we got a pretty good coverage uh, across um, different parts of the bay um, and found almost nothing from the 3C period. So we have three sherds, two and a half, or two and a maybe, um, from a couple of these B units in the northwest part of the bay. Um, so as far as we can tell, these kind of abundant scatters that we have on the islands and the coasts are not um, necessarily present. Um, in the territory that's ab able, possible to survey um, as of 2022. The mercantile adjective uh, emerges from our observation of um, the ceramic production site on Prasso uh, and the possible groundstone production center on Raftis. Um, so we also have the balance weight and some evidence for metallurgical production. Um, so perhaps right, the prosperity uh, that we observe uh, is arising from the sort of entrepreneurial spirit uh, that the people living on these islands seem to have possessed. Uh, they're producing uh, pottery, they're perhaps trading groundstone. Um, and uh, this gives us maybe a new clue as to the, the source of the prosperity um, of people in Puerto Rafti. Uh, I use the term documenting in the title because I don't think we can quite yet explain um, what's going on and why people chose to come here in the 12th century. Um, there's almost nothing in the Bay between uh, the end of the early Hellenic II period and the 3C period. So it seems to have been uh, empty for a long time. Um, so we, we continue to think through possibilities for interp interpretation. Um, but if we go back to the beginning of the talk, uh, thinking of the pros and cons of living on rafties, um, it seems that the cons uh, of the site being very steep, not particularly large, um, and without water, uh, was outweighed in the minds of its inhabitants by the advantages offered by a small, uh, seemingly safe site with good access to uh, maritime routes. So thanks again to the whole team and to everyone for supporting the project. And thanks to all of you for listening. Um, that's it.